at the sight of the lady with soft brown hair. Haunting images of my nine-year-old self lying in a puddle of blood clawed their way to the forefront of my mind. I could practically feel the hideous warmth slide along my back as I recalled the way that thick red trail slowly spread itself across the kitchen floor like an ink stain. Back in the present, painful tingles raced along my left thigh as the lady eased herself onto the bench alongside me. Before us sat a huge pond filled with ducks, geese, and a few swans. That's some heat today, huh? She asked. I pried my bacon sandwich apart to check for maggots. It's unbelievable. She grabbed a handful of breadcrumbs from her shoulder bag and tossed them onto the ground. Then a flock of noisy birds swarmed over her cream sandals. She glanced in my direction several times before finally saying, Have we met before? You look sort of familiar. Do you teach at Elm Grove Primary? No, I mumbled. You work on the high street then? I shook my head. After studying my face more closely, she said, Are you feeling okay? You look a little flush. Just tired is all. What's your name? Michael, I answered, then immediately kicked myself. Wasn't there a rule about revealing your identity in these situations? Pleased to meet you, Michael. I'm Mary. Our little handshake left me staring blankly at my own palm. After tossing some more crumbs out, she brushed stray morsels off her lap, stood, said goodbye, and finally started along the path toward the rear exit of the park. I tried getting up, but my weak leg had other ideas and made me topple back onto the bench. By the time I'd grabbed my cane, there was only an empty trail pinched between two walls of oak trees in the direction she'd set off. Odd. Back home, my wife Diana smoked a cigarette in the kitchen. Her most prominent feature, and the one clearest to me whenever I concentrate extra hard, were the scars along her cheeks and forehead, which became more prominent any time she lost her temper. Those marks were proudly on display as I rummaged through the fridge for a beer. Nice walk, she asked. I didn't answer. Thought you'd like to know that while you were picnicking, your daughter put a brick through the Armstrong's greenhouse. She stubbed her cigarette out in an ashtray on the counter. I'll pay for it, I said. So I'll just smooth things over with him again, shall I? Her gravelly voice chased me into the hall, toward the top of the staircase which led to the basement, as she dredged up the same tired argument we'd been having for months on end. I've got work to do, I finally yelled before slamming the door behind me. I couldn't really blame her for that reaction. There's only so many times you can stomach the neighbors screaming directly in your face and questioning your parenting abilities. Down in my little office, a cheap monitor displayed the floor plans of a three-story house, the same kind I hope to live in one day. Open plan kitchen, glass fronted bedrooms, the works. All afternoon my eyes strayed toward the bookshelf on my right hand side and by nightfall, I barely made any progress on the designs. I went upstairs and heated a casserole, which I ate alone. Exactly one week later, just as I finished my tea, a familiar voice from behind said, Why, hello again, Michael. It almost caused me to do a cartoon spit take. Clearly, my food poison-induced hallucination theory missed the mark. This seat taken? She asked, already circling the bench. I nodded for her to join me. She tossed a handful of breadcrumbs onto the ground which an army of pigeons quickly seized upon. So, how's you? I studied her. Those features all look so real. Right down to the freckle on her left ear and the calluses along her fingertips. I'm good, I said. Works a little stressful. What do you do? I'm an architect. Oh, fantastic. We sat in silence until, with a little snark, she said, What, who, me? Oh, I'm fine, thanks for asking. I forced an awkward and said, Sorry, how are you? I'm grand. Just finished work and thought I'd take advantage of the sunshine. What do you do? I asked, like I didn't already know the answer. I'm a seamstress, so tell me about yourself. You got a family? Kids? My wedding ring felt suddenly tight just then. A wife and daughter. What's your daughter's name? Jane. She'll be nine in May. Oh, same age as my son, little Mike. Maybe they go to school together. I don't think so. I answered sharply. She shot me a confused glance before saying, It's a wonderful age, huh? A slideshow of the endless parent-teacher interviews about my daughter's attitude problems flashed before my eyes. Definitely. 
Mike's going through a superhero phase right now. Everything's Batman, Batman, Batman. I'm taking him to that new film tonight. The park and everything in it suddenly dimmed. I clutched the side of the bench, my left thigh throbbing painfully. Michael? Mary said alarmed. Are you okay? I took several deep, desperate inhales. I'm fine. Just getting over a nasty virus is all. She placed a soft, reassuring hand against my forehead. For a moment, nothing in this world could have hurt me. A new image flashed before my eyes. Me, in bed with chicken pox. A thermometer poking from the corner of my mouth. Nearby, Mom sang as she sewed and rocked back and forth in her chair. Every so often, she reached over to brush away the sweaty hairs plastered against my forehead. Mary sat back, her eyes slowly scanning me from head to toe. Are you sure we haven't met before? I shook myself alert. No, and I'm fine, honestly. My eyes stayed fixed on the light rippling across the surface of the pond. Batman. Why did that strike me as so important? After a few minutes of friendly chatter, Mary got up and started along the path. Well, nice seeing you again. Batman, Batman, Batman. I snatched my cane and pushed myself up. Wait! She spun toward me. What's today's date? The 23rd. Of? She cocked her head to the side. I've been working so hard I lost track. June. That meant we were on the same day of the same month. And the year? I asked. So embarrassed blood rushed to my face. Michael, are you sure? I threw up a hand and forced an awkward laugh. Just kidding. I could work it out from what she'd already told me. After a cursory glance, she wandered in the direction of the rear exit, and then vanished as if engulfed by a heat haze out in the desert. A police car sat parked in my front driveway. After sleepwalking through the inevitable conversation with two officers, I repeatedly promised my daughter would receive punishment for the crank calls she'd made. Then I rushed into my office and scanned the bookshelf. On the second row sat a little brown diary with 9798, scribbled along the spine. I flicked it open at a page titled June 23rd, 1997. Time to scratch the surface of some childhood memories. I just got back from seeing Batman and Robin and it's probably the second best movie ever next to Terminator 2. I wish Arnold Schwarzenegger was my dad. He had this ice gun that froze people. I wish I had one. I'd use it to freeze Mrs. Silverstone. Isn't it weird how some teachers are out to get you? This one time I really needed to pee, but she wouldn't let me go because I hadn't finished my history exam. I thought about going all over her desk for fun. I suppose I shouldn't write things like that. If mom finds out, she'll get mad. Anyway, there's no point having a grudge since Mrs. Silverstone is old and will probably die soon. Mom and I had a small popcorn at the cinema. I asked her her favorite part of the movie and she said, Jeroj Clooney. That's the guy who plays Batman. I thought that was a dumb part of the movie to like more than an ice gun. I sank into my leather chair, past events crashing over me like a wave. Mary planned on taking her son to see Batman and Robin on June 23rd, the same day I went as a child. There had to be a perfectly logical explanation for this. Maybe I glimpsed the release date on Wikipedia and my subconscious filed this information away to use in a stress-induced hallucination. That evening, my wife threw me sour looks from across the table as our daughter made a big show of not eating her beef stew because it tasted worse than pickled dog shit. Well prepared for her next arrival, I asked how Mary was doing before she'd even sat down. You're in a chipper mood, she said, before making the birds swarm our feed by tossing out breadcrumbs again. I was starting to worry. You seemed a little zoned out last week. The two of us made idle chatter until finally she said, And how's your daughter? Jane, right? She's an angel, I said through gritted teeth. You should see Mike these days. Last week I told him we'd have to buy a new school uniform soon and he threw a big strop. He's been moping about the house ever since. Leg muscles twanging wildly. I reached into my pack and fished out a Batman figurine. Actually, speaking of Mike, I found this the other day. Jane didn't even take it out of the packaging. I thought he might like it instead. Her hands shot up in protest. Oh no, I couldn't! You can and you will. It'll only gather dust otherwise. She sighed, clearly touched by the kind gesture. Thank you. Don't mention it. As the doll passed from my hands to hers, a murmur went up. The park, the bench, 
and even the trees took a shuddery gasp. My teeth chattered in my skull, but only for a moment. Back home, I rushed into my study, grabbed the diary, and lay it flat on the desk. My hands would not stop shaking. July 28, 1997. I got a new Batman toy. Mom said it's from her friend and that I had to write him a thank you letter. In other news, summer's half over. Mom said we'll need to start buying things for school soon. I told her I wanted a Batman bag to go with my toy, but she said no. It sucks us kids only get two months off. Then it's right back to learning boring crap like geography and science. Art is okay though, and I like math sometimes. I got into another fight with Helen. When I showed her my Batman, she said Wonder Woman was better, so I pushed her into the dirt. She ran crying into her house and her mom marched over and told my mom what happened. Then I got grounded for two days. Helen is such a stupid crybaby. All girls are. I almost forgot. The other day mom and I went to see George of the Jungle. It was probably the fourth or fifth best movie ever. It wasn't as good as Batman though. I'm pretty sure Batman could beat both George of the Jungle and Wonder Woman in a fight. Unbelievable. Young Mike had a Batman toy, but I never owned one, did I? Throughout my childhood, every winter, we couldn't afford to put the heating on more than once per day. Outside of birthdays and Christmas, younger me never got toys. Yet, there I was, holding evidence to the contrary. And didn't I remember it, kind of? That summer remained a jangled, foggy mess. Hardly surprising given the circumstances, yet stashed away in some quiet recess of my brain lay an image of mom walking through the door, hands behind her back and saying, I've got a surprise for you. Had I really changed the past? This posed a number of questions, chief among them what to do about the tragic events of August 2nd. I needed a warner. That day kicked off a downward spiral that ruined both our lives. But this phrase kept turning over in my mind. Butterfly effect. One small change that results in big differences. If I tugged on a 20-year-old thread, what might unravel in the present? I flicked to August 5th, 1997, three days after the incident. I am in the hospital, and so is Mom. When I woke up, a doctor asked how I was feeling. I told him my leg really hurt. He said I'd lost a pint of blood and asked if I knew how much that was. I said 0.5 liters. The doctor said Mom will be in hospital for a long time but promised I'll be able to see her soon. I've drawn a picture of us at the beach to cheer her up because that's her favorite place, even though the events of that night never completely strayed from my subconscious. Rereading that entry made my leg feel like an overturned guitar string. From mom's perspective, she'd have the encounter in exactly one week and then spend decades ping-ponging between hospitals and assisted living facilities until she caught pneumonia developed sepsis as the result of the infection, and finally died. The act of saving her should have been a no-brainer. However, it came with a catch. I opened the diary marked 1213, January 15th, 2013. Mom's in the hospital again. I swear, this year it's just been one thing after the other. When all this is over, I'm taking her on holiday. Nothing fancy, maybe a weekend at the seaside to enjoy the scenery. In other news, I saved a life. I was on my way to the hospital when I spotted a car wrapped around a tree at the side of the road. Inside was a lady with so much glass lodged in her head, it looked like quills on a porcupine. She had cut on her arm so deep I could actually see bone. Beside her, a gray-haired man lay crushed beneath the dashboard. First thing I did was wrap my shirt around the huge gash on her arm and tie it with my belt. Then I called an ambulance. Two paramedics rushed her to the same hospital mom was in. Mom couldn't speak or move, but I held her hand for a few hours, telling her how much I loved her. The nurses said she'd been asking for me right up until they pumped her full of meds. On my way out, I asked about the lady who got in the car accident. When I explained I'd found the wreck, they let me speak with her. Her face was more stitched up than a voodoo doll, and she'd clearly been given a mountain of painkillers, but she remembered who I was. Her name was Diana. I offered her my sympathies, then came home. I don't know why I'm writing this rather than going straight to bed. It's been an incredibly long, incredibly shitty day. I sat there, lost in thought. 
The paramedics told me Diana would have died right alongside her father if I hadn't arrived in time to stifle the bleeding. However, if mom never got shot and developed a compromised immune system, it's extremely unlikely I'd have been racing along that highway on January 15th. If I don't happen across my future wife, she doesn't survive the crash, then she never comes over to thank me after her recovery. That means the two of us never bond over the shared grief of losing a parent, which in turn means we never raise the little bundle of joy known as Jane. You see my conundrum, but I had to do something. A heartfelt goodbye letter, maybe? I didn't sleep that night, or the next one. All week the situation turned over in my mind until, lying beside me in bed, my wife reached over, rubbed my cheek, and said, You seem more tense than usual. Although strained, our relationship wasn't all arguments and squabbles. The sun did occasionally shine through, usually whenever Jane behaved herself for a period. I'm fine, I said, eyes glued to the full moon shining through a rickety window. Just thinking about my mom. Already half asleep, she said. I wish I could have met her. Cheerful as ever, Mary sat next to me on the bench. Afternoon. Quickly, I cleared my throat. There's something I need to tell you. Me first. She reached into her purse. I've got a little gift here. She handed me a card from my past self. It said, Thank you for the Batman. It's the best present I ever got. Beside the message, he'd drawn a crayon-caped crusader. That's sweet. I said, dimly recalling the day I wrote it. After a heavy sigh, I made my voice all serious and said, Mary, please listen. Remember that first time we met, when you said I looked familiar? There's a reason for that. I paused. As the wind gusted, leaves scattered across the ground like lost memories. This is going to sound crazy, but you're my mother. Have you come down with another fever? She asked her eyes narrowing. I waved the suggestion aside. I can't explain it, but sitting here, this bench, it's like some sort of time bridge. To you, it's 1997, but for me, it's 2022. When we part ways, I go back to my present, and you go back to yours. She got up to leave. Nice chatting with you. My arm shots out to snatch her handbag, but she ripped it away, then now on high alert. She made a desperate break for the path. Unable to catch up, I shouted. Last week your son pushed Helen over and you grounded him for two days. You think he has a crush on her but is too stubborn to admit it. Mary paused mid-step her back to me. His favorite film is Terminator 2. His favorite subjects in school are art and math. Everything else, you have to nag him to even glance at his homework. Slowly, she faced me. She studied my eyes, my nose, my lips. Little by little, the realization spread across her face. Mike, tears formed at the corner of my eyes as I nodded and said, It's me. She took several slow steps forward while I held onto the bench, slightly hunched. Her right hand rose up and brushed my cheek, gently. Mike, she said again. Then with a furious shake of her head, she backed away. No. Left leg protesting, I fumbled after her grasping waist bins and tree branches for support along the way and with every step the world seemed to stretch out like an accordion into one long, endless corridor. Every sound, the birds, the wind, our footsteps, echoed toward a frequency only dogs can hear. Mary kept moving, seemingly unfazed by any of this. Was she even aware? Maybe the past appeared normal from her perspective. Every breath became a battle. It felt like trudging through a bowl of mom's hearty beef stew. The universe didn't want me chasing her into the past. If I kept on like this, what might happen to me? As one gelatinous step followed another, I flashed back to that awful night. A burglar broke in through the kitchen window, right as I wandered downstairs for a glass of water. Mom bolted in, alerted by my screams. Then she and the man fought, going round and round the room before he finally took out his gun and shot her. Six bullets went into her spine, one in the stomach. Somewhere amidst their desperate scramble, my leg got hit and down I went. Blood pumped out of my left thigh like a furious jet. Within seconds it coated every surface. The polka dot tablecloth, the cupboard under the sink, the patterned floor tiles. Already on the verge of death, 
Mom feebly crawled her way into the hallway on her elbows, leaving behind a trail of red. A house phone sat on a side desk in the landing, and when I craned my neck I just about saw her feebly reel it off the side table by the cord, because she couldn't stand or even lift her arms above her head. There's something I need to tell you. I rasped at her, back in the park. A desperate lunge brought me close enough to grab her arm. She shrieked. Tremors pulsated through my feet, the vibrations so intense they made my teeth chatter. The universe kept warning me to stop. Would it kill me if I went any further? Only one way to find out. I fumbled through my pocket and pulled out a letter and stuffed it into her handbag. Read this. It'll explain everything. A giant tremor rippled throughout the world as Mary snatched the bag away. The sudden jerking motion caused me to plunge face first into the dirt. And then I watched, helplessly as she scrambled toward the rear gate, glancing back over her right shoulder every so often, eyes big and frightened, until that heat haze took her once again. As I crawled back toward the bench like a commando, that horrible sensory confusion evaporated. Quickly the park compressed back to normal. My lungs opened up. By some miracle I'd survived. Given the circumstances, I could hardly blame Mom for her reaction. Unfortunately, I'd likely torpedoed any chance of her reading my letter hell. She'd probably suspect I laced the envelope with anthrax. Now I'd never get that goodbye. I returned home in a trance, only snapping alert when I walked up the driveway and saw the house I grew up in had magically acquired an extra story since I'd departed. Glass-fronted bedrooms now faced out onto the street. After double-checking the address, I hurried through the door into the kitchen and gasped at the sight of two strangers, a woman and a girl at the side of a kitchen island. Every surface had a gray, granite finish. I watched the pair roll out dough. A moment later, the sweet aroma of chocolate, butterscotch, and brown sugar hit my nostrils. That woman's blonde hair and green eyes struck me as familiar. But from where? Everything okay, hon? The woman asked. Her voice immediately uncorked my memory. She was what I imagined a grown-up version of Helen might look like. Beside her, propped up on a little plastic stool, stood a nine-year-old girl, roughly my daughter's age. They looked quite similar, too. Except, she had Helen's nose rather than my wife's. Before I could ask what they were doing in my house, my eye happened across a photo on the wall. Me and the woman cutting a wedding cake, both grinning like a pair of lovesick teenagers. As the room swayed from side to side, I staggered around, only now realizing I'd left my cane at the park. The girl looked up at me with her big green eyes and said, We're making chocolate chip cookies, Daddy. Unsure what to say, I fumbled my way toward the counter and wiped a smidge of butter off her cheek real. This was all real. Everything okay, hon? Helen asked. She cleaned her hands using the front of her apron and then pressed one of them against my forehead. You look a little flush. Just tired is all, I rasped. Maybe you should lie down? In a minute. I practically flew downstairs. My office looked much tidier than when I left that morning. Architecture awards and framed articles about my latest projects decorated the walls, and atop of the range IMAX sat on the desk. I grabbed the diary marked 9697 off the shelf. Now there was an entry marked August 2nd, 1997. Today was a good day. Mom said we were going on an adventure and took me to the beach. We built sandcastles and when the tide came in we went for fish and chips. We ate by the sea, and every time I threw a chip away, a whole flock of seagulls fought over it. Afterward, we checked into a hotel. Mom says it's important to treat yourself and have a little fun sometimes. I'm so tired I can barely keep my eyes open, so now I'm going to bed. I sat back, flabbergasted. I'd done it. I'd successfully changed the past. Now I didn't marry Diana. I married the girl next door instead. But wasn't that how it always went? Hadn't the story of our relationship already embedded itself inside my skull? My former spouse and daughter quickly became quiet echoes, their faces distant blurs. From the top of the stairs, Helen creaked open the door and shouted down, 
Don't forget your mother's coming over for dinner tonight. My heart soared. She'd survived. My former daughter was gone, but hadn't I still rescued Diana? Hadn't I warned Mom a lady needed rescuing one night in the distant future? Or had I considered that change too big a risk? After all, the universe clearly didn't like me playing God. Things were still deeply, deeply convoluted. Two sets of conflicting memories occupied headspace, but piece by piece, I felt the old ones dissolve. Fortunately, I had the diaries. My life story was just sitting there, itching to be read. Getting caught up wouldn't take long. Well, folks, that brings us to the end of this reality-warping tale that had my head spinning by the end. A huge thanks to the original author, Lighting Nations, for this trippy existential tale, and be sure to check out their other chilling works, linked in the description. The idea of being able to interact with the past and potentially alter the entire course of your life is equal parts fascinating and terrifying. Michael's desperate attempt to save his mother raised so many profound questions for me about the nature of existence and the ripple effects of our choices of our if this haunting story left you just as unsettled and full of existential wonder as i was i'd really appreciate it if you could smash that like button it helps grow the channel and lets me know you're digging these kinds of metaphysical mind twisters and make sure you're subscribed so you never miss my future narrations of more reality bending tales but i'm most eager to hear your thoughts and theories down in the comments what did you make of Michael's ability to interact with his past self? Do you think he was right to try and save his mother even if it meant radically altering his entire future timeline? Or should he have left the past untouched, no matter how tragic? Discuss your interpretations and let me know what you would have done in his situation. I'm really looking forward to diving into all the deep thought-provoking exchanges this one is sure to spark. As always, thank you so much for listening. I'll see you soon with another dimension-shattering story that will make you question everything you thought you knew about reality itself. Maybe keep an eye out for any time rifts opening up nearby.